Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where you are, but welcome. I am Cristiali Borges, Chris for short. I am a PhD student at the Federal University of Goiás in Brazil. I am uh, in the Ecology and Evolution program. And today I'm going to be presenting a chapter from my thesis about how climate, topography, and demography shape the patterns of the neotropic language diversity. So the first thing is that human culture is rich in diversity and different aspects of human culture change through the scent and are rich in diversity, such as languages. And they can be considered from an evolutionary perspective and as a measure of variation in human social behavior. And global patterns of human diversity are also spatially and demographically complex which allows for environmental, ecological, and demographic factors to be explored as possible drivers for that diversity. Languages specifically have been the most studied aspect of human diversity in transdisciplinary research in recent decades, and that's true especially for macroecology. And that's mainly due to the geographic pattern. They are today about 7,000 extended extant languages in the world. However, we can see from this map that the languages are unevenly distributed worldwide with a higher density occurring towards the equator. We can see here there is a higher language richness in the tropics. But even amongst the tropical areas, we can see that the continent of Africa has about five times more language diversity than the continent of South America. However, if we change the perspective on richness, if we look at the number of family languages or the phylogenetic diversity, we can see that the distribution changes and now South America has the highest diversity. So the neotropics become an interesting place to apply mechanistic models to language diversity questions and by the neotropics, we mean the biogeographic division, the biogeographic realm. This area is also geopolitically called Latin America, but we're going to call it the neotropics for biogeographic reasons. So this place, as we saw before, has the highest phylogenetic language diversity. It has the highest number of language isolates, and language isolates are family language families that have only one language so that language has no sister languages it stands by itself the language diversity found here is not correlated to biodiversity and we can see that because the highest diversity found in the neotropics is in today guatemala and not in the amazon where the highest biodiversity is and finally it was the last continent to be populated by homo sapiens so it has a really interesting history there this is the pattern of the observed language diversity. It's the pre-Columbian pattern, so it's the observed pattern found before European invasion, before the Portuguese and the Spanish conquered the region. So there was an estimated 986 languages occurring throughout the continent, and we can see a higher diversity happening along the coast following mountain chains from Sierra Madre here in Central America all the way down to the Andes in South America. So today there are about 560 extant languages from this total because most of the indigenous people were killed off. We expect altitude, precipitation, rivers, and group size to be the main mechanisms behind the observed pre-Columbian language diversity pattern for the neotropics. Regions with mountains and high river densities have been proposed as cradles of language diversity because they both provide high amounts of, of resources. They both help form and maintain small demographic, ethnic, and linguistically different groups because mountains act as a mobility restrainer and rivers work as, as social centers, allowing contact between populations. Precipitation has been found as a strong variable in many language diversity models, whether they're mechanistic or correlational in different continents. And finally, 
it has been argued that limits on group size may facilitate the division of social groups because the, the, the limit on group size can compensate the cost of maintaining social ties, such as recognizing relatives or unreliable individuals. So we created a mechanistic model that simulates those mechanisms to see if we can recreate the observed language pattern and the, and the number of languages found for the new tropics. So we created a model that there are only three premises, so our model is actually kind of simple. So the first premise is that human groups occupy empty spaces. The second one is that environmental carrying capacity deter determines groups' population densities. And the third premise is that groups have a maximum population size. This is a diagram of the logic behind our model. We combine mountains and rivers to calculate a hydrotopographic complexity map that looks like this. We use the hexagonal hybrid grid where cell sizes are inverse to the, to the topographic and hydrographic complexity, which means that the smaller cells are in regions of high elevation and high river width, and the larger cells are in lowlands. So that was used to define the cell size. We calculated the carrying capacity by using that formula right there, where K is the carrying capacity, P is the precipitation, and we use the layer for the P-industrial period from the Ecoclimate database. And alpha and beta are unknown parameters that we estimated through a Gibbs sampler, which is a MCMC method. And later, we, we also had the maximum population sizes, which was the maximum size a population could be for the hunter-gatherers. And that came from the database for Binford. And all that was used to define the occupancy of a cell. This is a video of how our simulation works. Simulation begins with 10 individuals representing a linguistic group. And they occupy a random cell in the map. As that population grows and reaches the cell's cal calculated carrying capacity, the group can colonize neighboring cells until it reaches its maximum population size. When the maximum population size is reached, another cell is colonized by 10 new individuals representing a new language group, and the cycle is repeated. So the results uh, we'll present here are preliminary. Other results are being produced as we speak, but we can see the pattern that emerges. The results here are from the best 100 models from a 1,000 parameter estimation run. So this is the observed language, language pattern that we've seen before. And this is the predicted language map. This is the predicted language map from only one replica. So we can see they are visually similar. These are our richness maps. We have here on C the observed language richness. And we can see that there are about 125 languages occurring in Central America, spe specifically in what is today Guatemala. And on D, we have the predicted language richness, which was created from our mechanistic model. And this is the average from the best 100 models. And cell size here is 300 by, th by 300 kilometers squares. And we can see that our model predicted a, a higher richness for the Andean region and not for Central America. This is our residual map, which is the observed minus the predicted richness. And we can see the regions where the model did okay and the regions where the model could have been better. We also ran a, a linear regression to see if our predicted richness can explain the observed language richness. And our model explains 12% of the variation in observed language richness patterns. So we also ran a simple correlation between the precipitation layer and the observed richness. And we saw that our model actually had a greater predictive power of 12%. Then the traditional then the, the traditional correlation, which was only 8%, and that upholds that mechanisms can be incorporated successfully into simulation modeling for ecological and evolutionary biodiversity process. 
on the right, we have a distribution of the total number of languages predicted by the past 100 models. We can see that the model produced an average of 988 simulated languages, and that is a difference of only two languages from the observed 986 languages. Moving on to the discussion. The high richness predicted in the Andean region can be explained by the higher mean annual precipitation occurring in that region in the past. And by our model's premises, these factors resulted in a high carrying capacity for, for these cells, in a higher carrying capacity for these cells. And similarly, our model's failure in predicting an accurate number of languages for Central America is probably due to that reason and also because it's probable that mean annual precipitation is not a main driver for Central America. Um, the greater observed language diversity there can be tied to the farming propensity of traditional human societies, which was shaped especially by uh, a richer environment that could sustain a greater diversity of domesticated plant and animal species. In contrast, populations in South America were more reliant on hunting, gathering, or fishing. There is a paper by Bruno Villela published in 2020 that shows that geographic vari variation in reliance on agriculture can be predicted by family languages. So the results presented here are preliminary. And again, we will rerun it for family languages to see if our model can recreate that pattern as well. Lastly, these are my collaborators, my co-authors. Thiago Rangel is actually my advisor, and together with Marco Tullio and Michael Gavin, they have been working with patterns of language diversity from a microecological perspective for other continents. And Thiago Chacon is a historical linguist that works with Amazonian languages. And I also want to thank my funder, CAPES, INCT, and my program. I would like to thank you all for listening. I'll take any questions if you have them. Um, if you want to reach me through email, it's right there. It's my name, Christielli at gmail.com. Or you can reach me through Twitter. I tweet mostly in Portuguese, but feel free to follow me if you want to. Thank you.